officially known as the Thunderbolt II. But universally as the Warthog because of its looks, over the last 30 years, this beast has earned another name on the battlefield, the Tank Buster. We're not the high sleek fast fire. We're the low, slow, ugly, you know, Warthog rolling around in the mud and doing the mission. It's where we love to be. Its amazing 30 millimeter seven barreled cannon is the most powerful gun ever to take to the skies. You go in there, squeeze the trigger, bunch of smoke. Wow, that's awesome. It smells like victory. With a single Warthog carrying enough weaponry to disable 16 main battle tanks, the A-10 is a legend to the soldiers who depend on life-saving air support. You can talk to troops on the ground and they love hearing that sound. It's the sound of freedom for them. Using extraordinary archive film and color reenactments, Battle Stations takes you into combat with one of the deadliest aircraft in the US arsenal, the A-10 Tank Buster. Throughout Operation Iraqi Freedom, the A-10 Warthog was the most well-known and feared plane in the U.S. Air Force. I think it was the best equipped Air Force and Army rated fight that, that we could have. Its ability to work in close support with ground troops, to take out enemy positions and tanks, and to act as a spotter plane made it a linchpin in the victory over Saddam Hussein and his regime. We're kind of like the insurance guy up there, or the 911 force. Uh, when they need help, they call. And that's who they expect to be there. But for the vision of a handful of men, this aircraft might never have been built. In the First World War, aircraft were used as a way of supporting the troops on the ground. Whatever resistance they came up against, the planes were called in to either bomb or strafe the enemy. Close support in cases of mobile warfare, of moving fronts, of fast moving combat, whether it was retreat or advance, close support was overwhelmingly important. In those situations of battlefield chaos, where it's very hard to get good artillery support, suddenly airplanes become overwhelmingly important and overwhelmingly effective. During the Second World War, such fighter bombers as the Typhoon, the Tempest, the Mustang, and the Thunderbolt I were used in close air support roles to good effect. But one single aircraft was feared as the ultimate close air support machine, the German Junkers 87 dive bomber, nicknamed the Stuka, and fitted with a screaming siren, demonstrated the most effective use of close air support ever seen. This is a time when the Germans were enormously outnumbered by the Russians and yet having extraordinary successes against very heavy, huge Russian tank forces. And a key component of that were these Stukas, of which the most famous unit was led by Colonel Rudel, who was the most decorated pilot of World War II. Colonel Hans Ulrich Rudel's unit wreaked havoc on the Russian front, with Rudel himself amassing a personal score of 511 destroyed Russian tanks. But with the defeat of Germany in 1945, the success of close air support was largely overlooked. On September the 18th, 1947, the United States Air Force was born. Its main focus, to deliver nuclear weapons. Close air support was not a priority. This is the extraordinary part of the whole genesis of the A-10. The Air Force, traditionally, from the beginnings of World War II on, had no interest in close support, have none today. They don't like working for the Army, that they prefer running their own war, totally independent of everybody else. A very natural bureaucratic reaction. During the Vietnam War, the Air Force had to rely on aircraft such as the A-1 Sky Raider to protect its ground forces. 
But what was clearly needed was an aircraft specifically designed to carry large bomb loads, absorb heavy ground fire, and fly for long periods at low altitude over the battleground. Taking the initiative, a group of highly skilled engineers at the Pentagon came up with the specifications for a close air support aircraft with the hope that the Air Force would eventually see the light. We designed the airplane based on the close support done by these A-1 pilots. We used the experience of the Germans on the Russian front with Stukas. And we actually interviewed Colonel Rudel, who was still alive at the time. We used his experience very heavily in the design of the airplane. And we tried to shape an airplane that was directly useful in specifically support of army troops in the field. A first in aviation history, the Air Force eventually initiated a competition for an aircraft to be specifically designed for close air support. When the request for the proposal on the A-10 came in, I immediately uh, was assigned to work on the aerodynamics of that. Fundamentally, she was to be a close air support airplane which was capable of knocking out heavy tanks, as well as operating from an unprepared short field of 1,500 feet. Fairchild Republic took on the challenge of designing an aircraft unlike any ever built. The winning design would be a stable, straight-winged aircraft to allow for excellent lift and maneuverability, combined with the General Electric's TF-34 turbofan engines, which would give it a high enough thrust for takeoff and a low enough fuel consumption to enable the plane to have very high loiter capability, essential for the role. With unbeatable durability and an easy to repair maintenance program, these would be the ideal engines to fly in a hostile battle zone. But for the Fairchild team, the challenges became apparent immediately. The typical way to build a jet airplane, and the reason that all jet fighters are impossible to use in this close support mission, because they all have fuel wrapped around the engine. Once you have fuel wrapped around an engine, a 22 rifle will kill you. One of our very first design rules was the fuel had to be someplace other than the engine. Not only was the fuel safely stored in the fuselage, away from the engines, the fuel tanks also had unique inbuilt fire suppression capabilities. The aircraft's hydraulics could also withstand serious firepower. We required that every hydraulic control had to be backed up by a simple mechanical cable system that's much harder to shoot out. If we could come back with the hydraulic system shot out, half the tail shot off, a piece of the wing shot off. It had two engines, you could come home on one. The pilot was bathed in a titanium tub, which could take 20 millimeter shells. It was uh, really a piece of machinery that you could fly into hell and back. The A-10's survivability was matched with a deadly capacity a huge 30 millimeter Gatling gun. Developed specifically for the A-10, the GAU 8A Avenger, capable of firing almost 4,000 rounds a minute, gave the aircraft the ability to blow through tank armor. Two, one, fire. She was designed primarily with that Gatling gun in the nose, and it was built to uh, destroy anything that was considered an armored weapon on the ground. But she was built around the gun, and the gun was a given from day one. Fairchild Republic won the competition to build the first aircraft in U.S. aviation history specifically designed for close air support. But before the Air Force would give the go-ahead, they wanted hard evidence that the aircraft and the gun could perform outstandingly together. The need would spark a series of simulation tests, unlike any ever produced. 
little would its designers realize, these tests would change the face of aviation history. Fairchild Republic had produced the ultimate piece of machinery to perform the role of close air support. But the Air Force was reluctant to go into production until they had seen for themselves that the aircraft could fulfill its very specific combat role. In a series of amazing tests, the A-10 and its remarkable gun were put through their paces in an effort to create a full-on Cold War battle scenario. We had secretly assembled what we proudly boasted at the time was like the third or fourth largest tank army in the world. Over 300 Soviet tanks from all over the world, off junk heaps and whatever, out in the desert outside Las Vegas. So we ran a program with A-10s, with a gun installed, and with the current ammunition as it was going into production. She had a very strange sound to those engines, very characteristic, and to this day, every time I hear it, I look up, uh, because I know it's my bird. <laughs> we knew what she'd do, and she didn't disappoint us. And we did a meticulous series of tests attack after attack, checking tactics, checking burst lengths, all these details to see how effective we were against tanks. We learned an enormous amount about it. The most important thing we learned was that this weapon had unprecedented effectiveness. During the Cold War, the threat of Soviet tanks advancing on Western Europe was at times a very real possibility. The Air Force finally gave the production of the A-10 the go-ahead. It was now ready to face a specific enemy. With its highly accurate weapons delivery platform, it was the ideal machine to defend against Soviet armored supremacy. The first A-10 arrived at davis monthan Air Force Base, Arizona, in October 1975. Immediately christened the Warthog, the A-10 was admired for its simplicity and ruggedness, rather than its good looks. It's kind of an ugly only a mother could love, is probably the way most of us describe it. It's, uh, it's, it's that ugliness is what makes it so tough. It's very rugged. People can compare it to like a Jeep or a Hummer or something like that. It's thick, it's big, everything about it is, is boxy and it looks very strong and sturdy. It's almost guaranteed to bring the pilot back alive. But with a top speed of only 420 miles per hour, high set twin engines and squared off slab-like wings, the A-10 was a far cry from any streamlined jet. It's pretty awe-inspiring. It was so much bigger than the, the aircraft I'd flown in pilot training. Just, it felt huge and it felt big uh, getting into it. And it was also intimidating just because it's the first time you fly the airplane, you're by yourself. But it was definitely exhilarating at the same time. The single-seat cockpit is surrounded by a large bubble canopy to provide all-round vision and a bulletproof windscreen. I love single-seat cockpit. That's one of the reasons that I was uh, enticed by the A-10. No one looking over your shoulder, no one telling you what to do. You put the aircraft where you want to do it and you employ it in the, in the fashion that you want to employ it. It's all personal and uh, you are the master. I think the first time that was one of the things that surprised me. It took itself right off the runway for the most part. Once it hits the speed it wants to fly, it just lifts up and away. And I think it probably has to do a lot with the big straight wing, positive camber on the wing. It wants to fly. The plane reacts to you. It's like a, you kind of strap on the plane itself, and it's an extension of you. And it flies. It has a feel of a real stick and rudder. 
the A10 is known for its tight turn radius, so it can turn on a dime. You can even look at the ground as you're turning, and it looks like you're just turning in space. Straight wing lets us turn very, very tight. So even though we're going slow, we've got a very small turn radius, and we can very quickly move our flight path uh, so that we can dodge all those, uh, the AAA and the surface-to-air missiles. But it's the challenge of the unique close air support role that is the main attraction to A-10 pilots, flying in an environment where anything could happen at any time. The mission that we do is not a rote uh, mission. You don't come into it knowing exactly every single thing that's going to happen from the time you take off to the time you land. Once you get in the air is where it starts actually unfolding, and you have to react to that. You hear American voices on the radio screaming because they're taking fire and that there are people dying. Their artillery can't get the enemy. They call in the intense. Flying of the airplane has to become secondary. Now you're trying to employ the weapon system, and that's where it gets complicated. We get maps spread out in the cockpit, and we're still trying to talk on the radios and keep from getting shot at. You know, we consider ourselves the last gunfighter uh, that's really out there because when you go into battle and it's a close-in cast fight, the number one weapon of choice of an A-10 pilot is going to be their gun. The weapons delivery system incorporates a heads-up display, or HUD, that provides the pilot with the references for flight control and weapons employment. It's incredibly accurate for a gun system and uh, probably one of the most flexible weapon systems in the world. It's just point and shoot, just like you'd imagine a revolver in your hand. You point it where you want to shoot it, you pull the trigger, and that's where the bullets are going to go. When you roll in and, and you pull the trigger for the first time, you get excited and the adrenaline starts pumping through and it just, I had the biggest smile on my face. What a feeling shooting the gun. I mean, the whole airplane shakes. The first time I, I fired the gun, you know, I had to come off the trigger because it scared me because I couldn't believe something like that could come out of the front of the airplane, all the flames, the smoke. This 30 millimeter bullet is the size of my forearm and that smell of gunpowder, you get that in the cockpit after you fire the gun, and it's just incredible. It's, it's, you get a little bit of a high from it, I think, sometimes. It smells like victory. But it would be some time before the pilots would be using their gun in anger. With the ending of the Cold War, the mass tank fleets of the Warsaw Pact no longer seemed such a threat, and the US Air Force planned to withdraw the A-10 fleet from service by the 1990s. But with a serious situation brewing in the Middle East, all that was about to change. The Warthog was about to play a key role in bringing down one of the most destructive individuals of recent times. In September 1980, Iraq invaded Iran, beginning one of the longest and most destructive wars of the 20th century. After eight years, the basic issues dividing the countries remained unresolved. In an effort to contain the Ayatollah Khomeini and the spread of Islamic fundamentalism, the West backed Iraq. Saddam Hussein, the Iraqi dictator, began to build up a formidable war machine bolstered by the Soviets and the West, creating the fourth largest army in the world with over 4,000 tanks. On August the 2nd, 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. For 15 years, the A-10 had awaited the chance to justify its place in the Air Force inventory. For the Warthog, it was now make or break time. When the first Gulf War started and our squadron deployed down there, approaching that time period, the Air Force was considering getting rid of the airplane. It wasn't until the Gulf War came around that we proved the fact that we are a capable cast platform. When war broke out on the 16th of January, 1991, there was an urgent need for a missile-launching tank buster. The A-10s were committed to combat for the very first time. Back then, you know, we had nobody with combat experience except for a few of the very senior leadership that had flown in Vietnam. 
So a lot of people are unsure what to expect. Deployed to the Gulf to back up coalition ground forces, A-10 squadrons were launched on Iraq's thousands of tanks in the mother of all battles. First day, I'll never forget that feeling. It was like, wow, this is a big game. You know, you're all pumped up, adrenaline's flowing. You know, let's go. You know, you go in, we hit a target, and uh, I remember looking down and going, what's all that sh glittery stuff down there? And sure enough, it was, uh, you know, them shooting. Oh, whoa, they're shooting at us. And that's when it kind of hit you, you know? This isn't just training right, anymore. The way that I saw the Iraqis working is, if they knew we were gonna hit something, they moved it. And they played lots of shell games. And it's kind of like a, you know, which, where are they hiding it now? By February, the coalition air forces appeared to be dominating the skies, and the A-10 was seemingly invincible. And we're feeling pretty confident. You know, if you survive your first 10 combat missions, your chances of surviving the war are pretty, go up significantly. Major Rob Sweet was on his 30th mission for Desert Storm. On the 15th of February, he was the wingman in a two-ship mission launched deep into Iraqi airspace. It was a little far into bad guy land for an A-10. It was uh, about 100 miles past the border where good guys were. And my flight lead, who was obviously a lot more experienced and wiser than I was, was a little concerned about the mission. With the Iraqis' ammunition running low, Saddam's forces were being more selective about their targets and seeking to maintain a higher strike rate. So we said, all right, well, we won't hang out as much as the target. We'll take two, three passes, and then we'll leave, go somewhere else. There's a formation of tanks in a circle about three miles in diameter, uh, no craters anywhere. And we were kind of aware that maybe these were plywood dummy targets. Sweet's flight leader rolled in to take a closer look at the target and then cleared his wingman in. For Sweet, what began as a routine mission was about to turn into his worst nightmare. As I'm coming off, sure enough, here comes the uh, Sam. Well, whoa, that ain't good. But if you see it, you can beat it. So I saw it, put out some chaff flare, I kind of pulled around it, and, uh, and it missed, sure enough. But it, got, it was close. In fact, that is the closest I'd ever been coming to getting hit by anything. So I went from being, whoa, that scared the living daylights out of me to uh, losing my professionalism somewhat and getting really pissed off at this guy for scaring me. So you know, he, he was going to die for, for doing that. As I was rolling in, you know, I felt a loud bang in the airplane, and uh, I went, ooh, that isn't good. And I looked back, and uh, I didn't like what I saw. Uh, most of my right wing was gone. It was on fire. I think to myself, OK, bad hit, bad hit, but there's still some wing on there, and I should be able to fly it out of there, and the A-10's pretty rugged. The Iraqi missile, which would have destroyed most other fighters, seriously crippled the A-10. The plane enters a steep spin slash spiral, starts spiraling on down. I'm throwing switches, trying to recover. I'm yelling, yeah, I can't recover. And, uh, and then I start to panic. And I remember just seeing a desert getting, coming up like this. And time to get out. The ACES-2 ejection seat is a fully automatic catapult rocket system. Once ejected, the parachute automatically deploys. I'm coming down on my parachute. Now I see my A-10 hit the ground. And that was kind of disturbing. As Sweet hit the ground, he was seized by Iraqi soldiers. You know, and they were on me before I even had a chance to roll over. And then they, uh, it was their chance to get some payback. And so I got the crap beat out of me, basically. Taken away to a command bunker, he was interrogated. I thought I was going to get shot at any moment, you know. It took me about three days to figure out, hey, they weren't going to just arbitrarily execute me. It was worth something to them, propaganda or intelligence or something. In March, Major Rob Sweet was eventually released as part of the prisoner release program. This is when I found out what happened to my flight lead. After I had been shot down, my flight lead had been shot down. And it turns out he never got out. Lucky to be alive, 
he spent four months recovering from his ordeal. If I would have been flying any other fighter when I was hit by the SAM, and it was a bad hit, I'd be, I'd be dead right now. But despite this, the aircraft proved more versatile and better able to survive over enemy territory than anyone had expected. During the 40-day conflict, the A-10 force destroyed 987 tanks, 926 artillery pieces, 1,355 combat vehicles, 10 fighters on the ground, and two helicopters shot in air-to-air -air engagements. The Air Force's ugly duckling earned a new nickname, the Tank Buster. The result confounded all those who had questioned the need for a dedicated ground support aircraft. Flying a staggering 8,500 sorties, A-10s were responsible for more than half of Iraq's losses of military equipment in Operation Desert Storm. Tragically, this remarkable record was marred by a number of incidents in which coalition forces were mistakenly attacked by A-10s. Now, there was an incident yesterday in which an American A-10 inadvertently fired on two of our infantry fighting vehicles. The aircraft was one of several which had been called in to deal with an enemy position, and the incident itself is, of course, under investigation. Nine British soldiers were killed. The Air Force was adamant that it could eliminate friendly fire incidents. What nobody knew was that the next challenge for the A-10 would be in an entirely new and forbidding battlefield, Afghanistan. The A-10 had proved itself a success in Desert Storm. But for this aging aircraft to remain integral to the Air Force attack plan, it would have to meet the constraints of an ever-changing battlefield. The A-10 got quite a few upgrades. No new engines or anything like that, but more avionics upgrades. We were able to uh, incorporate systems that had, that had come online, uh, the global positioning satellite systems. The A-10 was the first fighter to fully integrate with the night vision devices. Uh, the whole cockpit is, is modified to use night vision goggles. Um, we've been training with them longer than pretty much any other fighter community. And uh, we've gotten very good at it. The A-10 was destined for a new mission. On September the 11th, the war against terrorism began. Our response involves far more than instant retaliation and isolated strikes. Americans should not expect one battle, but a lengthy campaign, unlike any other we have ever seen. The Warthog strengthened Operation Enduring Freedom by spearheading urgently needed around-the-clock cover for ground troops in Afghanistan. For the crews of the A-10s, it was like nothing they had ever seen. We arrived in uh, Bagram, reported to my commander, and I said, boss, this has got to be the scariest place on Earth. We really felt like you were in the middle of a combat zone, and we were. The A-10 was the ideal aircraft for the Afghanistan battlefield. The jet is versatile enough to navigate mountainous peaks and deep valleys, while also patrolling and pinpoint attacking its targets. It wasn't bad flying over the mountainous terrain. The bad part was if I ever had to get out of the airplane, there's a lot of snow down there. That's not a good place to be. Uh, going from a nice warm cockpit down into the snow is not an idea that I want to have to uh, fulfill. The airplane, higher altitudes than what we normally would fly just because of the heights of the mountains over there. Uh, we were able to go places that the other fixed wing assets may or may not have been able to get in very well. Uh, and we definitely went places that the helicopters couldn't get in. Around the clock, Warthogs supported regular and special forces soldiers while combing the mountains of Afghanistan for enemy rocket launch sites and mortar posts. As its pilots soon realized, every mission would test their training and their wills to the limit. We showed up just past dark 
and got a brief, was handed a set of maps, and was told, hey, there's a lot of ground guys who are in trouble. Go out there and do what you do. Didn't have a whole lot of uh, situational awareness on what was going on in the ground. So, and when we checked in, the radios were just going crazy with guys calling for uh, close air support. Your pulse rate goes up. The uh, intensity of, of what you're thinking about goes up. You know, the adrenaline rush, it's a good feeling though. And what's nice is you turn your airplane towards the fight and your training takes over. So first thing we're looking for is what's the overall situation on the ground and get a big picture view and then move into the area. And once we get into the area, have a pretty good idea of where everybody should be. Now we'll move from the big picture to the much smaller concentrated area. And one of the first things I'm gonna try to do is look, look down and try to find where the friendly position is. And if I can't identify him exactly, I wanna at least narrow down something that I can use as a line in the sand and say, okay, we can't drop past here because that's where our guys are. On entering the battle zone, one of the A-10 pilot's main responsibilities is to avoid friendly fire incidents at all costs. What we mainly have to help us avoid fratricide is our radios and our eyes. Very low tech, but I think that's what makes us more efficient. Yes, we have a global positioning system that helps us figure out where we are. And we have night vision goggles that find out what's down there. But when it comes time to find out where the target is, yeah, we gotta use old-fashioned Mark I eyeballs and our hands to think about where that is, because without that, we couldn't do our mission. We went in there, and the night vision goggles were really hard to use because the sun was, had set, but it wasn't low enough where we were getting a lot of brightness coming from the west. So it was really difficult to use the NVGs. There was no moon illumination, and we're in this very harsh terrain that I've never seen before. A team of observers down on the battlefield work with each pilot to guide the aircraft to its target. The Terminal Attack Controller, or ETAC, works for the Army and is responsible for ensuring that the A-10 pilot identifies and attacks the correct target while minimizing the risk to friendly ground forces. We pass them a situational update, an area update on what's going on in the battlefield. Uh, let them know where the friendly troops are, what the situation is of the enemy, and uh, they kind of give them a heads up of what the threats are in the area. We'll pass them all that information, uh, they'll copy it down, uh, they work their little magic in the cockpit. The A-10 is linked to the ground commanders by an army radio network, which distributes data throughout the battlefield. He said, hey, here's where we are, and uh, I need you to put some ordnance down 700 meters from us, which, that was eye-opening. And uh, so we took that distance and rolled in and put a couple of 500 pounds bombs down and it immediately uh, quieted the target area. It's kind of like a large dragon breathing fire. Uh, that's what I can see, you know, it sounds uh, really loud. Uh, like a dinosaur, really, raining lead from the sky. Like guardian angels, the A-10s continue to fly over Afghanistan, protecting their friends on the ground until the war against terrorism ends. But an old enemy was waiting in the wings. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil, arming to threaten the peace of the world. The need for the A-10 would reach its climax in March 2003. Saddam Hussein's horrific regime was reaching fever pitch. This time, it would take an army, with the A-10 in the front line, to bring him down. March 2003, Saddam Hussein's forces were about to come head to head with the A-10 tank buster, as it once again prepared to fly over the battlefields of Iraq. The coalition forces meant to end the regime of Saddam Hussein for good, and the warthog had come a long way since its last desert battle. By the time the second Gulf War, the Iraqi freedom comes along, pretty much every airplane had been modified to improve the weapons accuracy. 
The AGM-65 Maverick missiles are highly accurate, carrying warheads specifically for targeting heavy armor. Infrared imaging guidance enables them to shoot moving targets at night. Combine these with the already large weapons load and the special laser targeting pods, and the Warthog was better prepared than ever for its deadly role in Iraq. Flying from the Seas Talil Air Base in southern Iraq, A-10s flew numerous sorties as coalition forces launched one of the greatest military offensives since the Second World War. The assault on Baghdad. For the A-10 crews, it would be the challenge of a lifetime. We're flying up towards Baghdad. We're excited to go up there, but the hair on the back of our necks was standing up and uh, your heart was beating really fast. I actually said a lot more prayers stepping into the cockpit that day. There's all those different emotions running through your mind and you're saying, please, you know, let me do what I'm trying to do and do the right thing. Calling the Warthogs to their targets, another essential member of the ground command team, the forward air controller, or FAC. A-10 pilots take turns to carry out this job using their specialist knowledge of the mission in the air to coordinate with the soldiers on the ground. We go to a battalion and uh, we speak Air Force to the Army. We make sure the uh, no fratricide occurs. Uh, Air Force doesn't shoot the Army, Army doesn't shoot the Air Force. Keep them deconflicted, but then secondary to that is make sure that those A-10s affect the battlefield for the Army. Everyone's talking, just trying to get permission uh, to actually execute the attack. And those sound like simple questions and this sounds like, you know, pick up the phone, ask, but when you're asking uh, one airplane who's relaying to another guy who's probably, uh, you know, four or 500 miles away sitting in a room somewhere, it takes time. And oh, by the way, every aggressive fighter pilot in Iraq at this point is making the same phone call, trying to get permission. Thanks for the work, sir, you got your name. The FAC is the A-10 pilot's first point of contact on arrival in the area. Part of his role is to provide the pilot with the target coordinates, which he does with great efficiency. It sounds cold-hearted, but it's very systematic, you know? They tell us the targets, we find the targets, we kill them, we report it's killed, next target. And it just goes, next target, next target. On arrival over the battlefield, the A-10 pilot often uses basic technology to locate exactly where the target is. In pilot Eric Yahimowitz's case, an Iraqi missile site. I went down with the binoculars and was searching the target coordinates. Uh, the six missile launchers weren't where they were supposed to be. So it took me a little while to search the area. The Iraqis had moved them probably about uh, half a mile to a mile away. You know, I'm thinking to myself, OK, I don't know if that radar operator sees me with that missile, and, uh, but I see the target next to it. And uh, it was just an awesome feeling. Your focus then, all of a sudden, is into this one little area is what you're looking at. As you roll down, pilots call it the shoot, or when you roll in to employ, that's it, the whole world melts into just this little area. And I was able to lock this thing up and fire that missile and it came screaming off the rail. From over 17,000 feet, the long-range 300-pound launch and leave Maverick missile traveled to its target. For Yahimoitz, the second seemed to go on forever. I'm waiting and I'm thinking, oh man, the missile went stupid. You know, it went flying into Iran. It should have hit by now. And uh, I'm like, oh man, I'm in trouble. It just felt like an eternity. It is surreal. You're so far up, it's hard to hear anything on the ground. You're so used to hearing the jet. It's like the white noise of having a fan in the background. But then all of a sudden, boom, I mean, just a massive explosion and it is totally elation. Now I know I got him. You pull off, get a little more altitude, and then turn back and uh, take a look. And it's a little fire show for you. <laughs> it's just so professional, it's unbelievable. There's not a lot of hooting and hollering, and you know, it's not like Top Gun, people screaming, yeehaw. I mean, it's, it's war and people are dying, and everyone knows it. You know, we're sitting on the edge of our seats, concentrating that we don't get shot down for once, and then uh, that we don't hurt the wrong people. Going in there, I said, I have two objectives. 
One, zero fratricide. Two, affect the battlefield. And they were in that order. My number one goal was to prevent fratricide. Knowing where the friendly forces are is paramount if the A-10s are to protect them. And losing sight of troops on the ground can lead to mistakes or deadly friendly fire. As a fighter pilot, that's our first job to find out, is there anyone out here that we don't know about? You know, it comes down to a fight with uh, friendlies nearby. Weapons release is going to be authorized by the guy on the ground. So you have to have that warm fuzzy that you've got the complete picture that you know these are friendly troops, those are enemy troops. But even with all the advantages of modern technology, relying on this alone would seriously jeopardize the troops on the ground. Yes, there are technological ways. There are also old school ways, giving a good talk on, making sure you're confirming with that uh, aircraft that he really does see the friendlies. There's a, a thousand ways to make sure that he's looking at the right thing and you're all, you all are on the same page of music. And uh, I used every single one of them because I'd rather drop uh, zero bombs and have zero fratricide than drop a thousand bombs and have one be on a friendly position. Despite the fear of horrific friendly fire accidents, the feeling of flying the plane is the love of every hog driver and the reason for signing up. It's no race car, you know, it's not the Porsche, you know, it's, it's not even a pickup truck in such a neat, neat airplane because I feel like I'm flying with the seat of my pants. I can feel everything that's happening to the airplane. None of it's magic, it's all me. Whatever it does, I made it do. The 60 warthogs deployed for Iraqi freedom dominated the skies, firing an incredible 311,597 rounds of 30 millimeter ammunition. The flying gun performed superbly. We lost a few pokes in the first Gulf War. Uh, we didn't lose any in the second. Lost airplanes, but we didn't lose people. Uh, that's a testament to the aircraft itself. If I had to, to be in an airplane and be shot at, the A-10 is the only one I want to be in. The A-10 is an awesome airframe, and the fact that it works with you, and it feels like it's a part of you, um, and it's it's one of the only airframes left that it's true flying. You can feel it fly. The A-10 means close air support at its finest. It's been my home now for uh, eight years, and, and I love it, and I'm, I hope I get to stick with it, and I hope uh, we get the upgrades we want to take us into this next century and uh, keep supporting the Army. But uh, I think it's just an awesome weapons platform. It fills a specific niche, and it does it really well. Able to keep flying with battle damage that would cripple many other designs and lethal to any armored vehicle in service, the humble warthog of the 1970s has come to rule supreme over the digital battlefields of the 21st century. Due to remain in service until at least 2025, the A-10 Warthog has proven itself to be one of the most effective aircraft ever flown by the U.S. Air Force, and a legend to those involved with it. She is not very clean when it comes to protuberances and, and bumps, and so she's not the sleekest looking piece of machinery that I ever designed. But she got the job done. to the Air Force Academy and I became interested in that when uh, my a friend of mine in high school's older sister went and that's how I found out about it. it sounded interesting, free education. Uh, I knew I wanted to get out of my hometown at least for a while. Not that I anything against my hometown, it's a wonderful place. West Virginia, it's not very exciting though. Uh, so I went to the Air Force Academy, uh, class of 88 and uh, when you're a cadet there you do some basic flying, gliders, Cessnas and I really uh, took a liking to it and thought, well, this is what I want to do, at least for the, the near future. Uh, so I graduated, and back then, if you graduated from the academy, you were guaranteed a pilot slot, uh, no matter what your grades were. 
<laughs> and uh, so I got a pilot slot. Unlike ROTC, where you had to be pretty, you know, kind of 4.0 student to get a pilot slot. So I uh, went to pilot training out of there and uh, in uh, 1988 to Columbus Air Force Base, Mississippi. And uh, I was pilot training class 8912. Did pretty well. Got my first choice, which was uh, the A-10 in Myrtle Beach, uh, specifically, because I wanted to uh, not only fly the A-10, because I thought the mission was interesting, and uh, it was green, and it flew low, and it had shot bullets and drop bombs and all that neat stuff, but uh, uh, also they were at Myrtle Beach, which was a primo uh, place to be stationed. I used to go vacation there in, in the summers, and, you know, living life at the beach as a single guy on fly status is, is pretty nice, pretty attractive at the time. <laughs> But that was mostly our focus at the time. Well, a couple weeks later, just out of nowhere, you know, to us anyway, Saddam Hussein uh, decides he wants Kuwait and he takes it. Uh, we get recalled, and uh, initially my commander told me I wasn't going. I was the youngest guy in the squadron, and uh, we were overmanned uh, back then. And, uh, of course, I wanted to go. You know, who wants to be left behind, especially for a young guy? I don't want to be left behind. I want to go. I don't want to be left out of fights. But I ended up going. Some guy had a, one of the guy's uh, wife was about due, so he stayed home with her and for a little while. Well, you bet, because uh, a lot of us were angry. I was angry. You know, we're stuck over here for six months and because of you, so uh, let me at him, quite frankly. You know? Anyways, I, I was a young guy. Again, I had a... Uh, uh, we felt like it was being empowered to us to get a, get us out of there and get home, as opposed to some diplomat somewhere. Now it's our turn to get us out of here. Plus, you know, we wanted to liberate Kuwait. They obviously took that and belonged to them. They were being uh, mean, and you know, we're hey, you're not supposed to have uh, you know this is the end of the 20th century. You're not supposed to have dictators anymore, right? Okay, yes. When I saw the Sam, it uh, you know there was a, it was a nice white smoke trail following it. You, know, you couldn't miss it really, with a little plume where it had launched out of the of a revetment. You could see the rocket motor, and uh, you know it wasn't moving in my canopy laterally. You know, two dimensional picture is just getting bigger. It ain't moving left or right, which means it's, it's on a collision course. And so what you want to do is get it to move left or right, preferably uh, aft, so it'll miss you behind you. You want to see some what they call line of sight, relative motion. Uh, so I made that happen, and sure enough, the last minute it went real line of sight, real far to the back, and, and missed behind me. Uh, so I went from being, whoa, that scared the living uh, daylights out of me to going to uh, losing my professionalism somewhat and getting really pissed off at this guy for scaring me. And uh, so you know, he, he was going to die for, for doing that because, you know, he, where that Sam launch came from, there was no mistake in where it had come from. Uh, my flight lead rolls in, he uh, puts some 30 millimeter down on it, no secondaries, that means nothing blows up, so we weren't sure if we hit it. Uh, I'm about ready to roll in. You know, now we should have left at this point, because we're almost out of gas. In fact, we would have left if, if I hadn't got launched on by the sand, but uh, we, were, we made guys pay for shooting at us. You know, if you're going to shoot at us, you're going to pay. And uh, as I was rolling in, you know, I felt a, a loud bang in the airplane and uh, kind of a pop, and I went, ooh, that isn't good. And uh, kind of, I, I had been rolling in, so I had some bank in, and it rolled me wings level. And I looked back, and uh, I didn't like what I saw. Uh, I had uh, been hit by something, a SAM launch, because about the time I'd been hit is when my flight lead called out the SAM launch. Uh, most of my right wing was gone. It was on fire. And uh, I went, oh, whoa, this ain't good. And uh, I, went, I immediately, you know, you get the lump in your throat, and uh, you start run flying through your switches and you kind of get into a little temporal distortion here because everything's going so fast the adrenaline pumps it starts going up like that uh, i came inside looked at some gauges looked at some lights there's a lot of caution lights a lot of gauges flying around i try to turn i immediately call out to my flight that i'm hit and i try and point to the nearest uh good guy land let's get the good guy land get out of bad guy land and uh from the time i got hit to the time i went out of control was about 10 seconds and i got hit pretty high up a couple miles up and uh, the plane kind of rolled off to the right, and I'm trying to tell it to go left, and that's very unnerving for a pilot to, for your airplane not to be doing what you tell it to. Hey, you're supposed to go this way. It's like, it's just unnerving. I don't know if you've ever been in a car where your steering wheel isn't connected or something like that. And uh, as it's rolling off like this, I'm trying to recover, and it's not working, and, uh, and then I start to panic. Like, oh, this is, this is really bad now. The plane kind of does a spiral, because at the time I'd think to myself, okay, bad hit, bad hit, but there's still some wing on there, and I should be able to fly it out of there, and the A-10's pretty rugged. Some guys have been hit. Although not this bad, but I'm trying to think positive, uh, and had made it back. The plane enters a steep spin slash spiral, starts spiraling on down. I'm throwing switches, trying to recover. I'm yelling, "Yeah, I can't recover!" And uh, 
I kind of just stopped for a second. I realized, I realized this, I said, and I, you kind of, I realized at this point I was defeated. It's almost like getting defeated in a, in a contest. And I remember just seeing a desert getting, coming up like this. And uh, as I'm going through about 6,000 feet, I see it, and I'm going straight down. I see it on the HUD, 6,000 feet. And I'm like, well, time to get out. And at the time, there was some debate amongst the older guys. I ain't getting out because they'll capture me and torture me to death anyway. I'm just going to ride it in. And, uh, you know, I was like, well, geez, I don't know. Or, you know, I'm going to save one bullet for myself, all that kind of stuff. Because, you know, Iraqis are brutal, vicious act they were doing. We all know what they did to the Kuwaiti people. And, uh, but, hey, you know, I, if I don't punch out, I know I'm dead. So at least it might not be a good chance, but it's the only chance you got. So I went ahead and uh, ejected. Uh, well, I'm coming down on my parachute, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, not liking my options because it's not looking good. But I, I do, I'm trying to be optimistic, and uh, uh, directly beneath me is not, uh, there's no uh, bad guys. It's just barren desert, and, they're, and the formation we have been attacking is a couple miles to the south. Now, I do see my A-10 with a big, huge white smoke trail below me hit the ground, and that was kind of disturbing. But... Uh, as I'm coming down, I, I think I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, I'm going to hit the ground here. Uh, you know, in the desert, you can see somebody standing up miles away. So you don't, you know, I was going to lay down or bury myself in the ground, wait till nightfall, and then hopefully uh, get picked up and rescued. So that's that's my game plan. Got to have a plan, even if it isn't a good one. Anyway, so uh, but what I uh, neglect to remember at the time was. Uh, because uh, I've since gone to jump school, but I didn't have my jump wings at that time, was uh, there was about a 40-knot wind out on the north. So I keep going over to these guys, where, where these guys are. And I'm trying to turn the thing. And, uh, you know, and a parachute will move about five knots, five to seven knots. But when you got 40 knots pushing you all the way, that's insignificant. So I keep driving over to these tanks. Oh, God, why do I keep going over there? And as I'm getting lower, I'm thinking, well, maybe these really are dummy tanks and there's, you know, there's not anybody around. But as I get... You know, a thousand feet or so above the ground. I like, no, those are real tanks. But I don't see any people around. You know, the whole time forgetting that they had just been shooting at us. But I don't see any people around. So I'm thinking, well, maybe they're buried up in the in the bunkers and they're high and they don't see me coming down here in my nice white orange parachute. So I'm trying to remember my training and I go, okay, feet knees together. I don't want to get hurt here. Eyes on the horizon. That's what you do when you're when you're coming down the parachute. And uh, just about the time I'm doing this, I, the whole world erupts. I hear shooting, 50 cow stuff going off. I'm like, good goodness, how you know, how can they miss? So I'm, at first, I thought at the time I thought they were shooting at me. Later on, I thought maybe not. Uh, as I reflected on it, they may have actually been just shooting in the air, or they may have been shooting at my flight lead. And I'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, so I look up, and I happen to, I'm about I'm about ready to hit the ground, but I, I looked over to my left side, and there's a T-72 about 20 yards, which is the main battle tank that way. There's about 40 or 30 guys in a line here, and there's about another 30 guys in a line here, all about 10, 12 yards, 20 yards away. So I'm like jumping into a football stadium. And so, whoa, I, you know, I, I immediately made the rookie mistake of trying to stand up. You can't, you know, it's like jumping off a two-story building. You can't land on your feet. You're going to fall on your face, but I tried to anyway. And if it would have been hard ground, I would have broke my leg, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to lay down. I wanted to try and stand up and stand on the ground or run or something. Uh, so I stuck my one foot out to try and do that, and of course I went feet face and landed right on my face and uh, tore my Achilles tendon, not all the way, but about three quarters away. So it swelled up and caused me problems the rest of my captivity. But uh, you know, and they were on me before I even had a chance to roll over. Uh, and then they, uh, they uh, it was their chance to get some payback, and they uh, took it out of my noggin. So uh, I got uh, you know, and these were conscript guys, you know, young privates and so I got the crap beat out of me basically but I got a pretty hard head and uh, luckily it didn't crack open <laughs> uh, well at the time I, the officers were kind of yammering at each other in Arabic about some stuff and I was uh, you know I was of course what are they saying you know and I thought they were debating whether I was even worthy to keep or not lieutenant how much does that guy I shoot him probably worth of it so I there was a car that had pulled up and I was standing there and uh, the doors were open, and so I, I just went and got in the car on my own initiative. They weren't happy about that. So the guy on the other side of the car started beating the crap out of me for doing that, but I stayed in the car. And then they came and we drove off. <laughs> so I was like, let's get this train rolling, you know, kind of thing. And so they drove me around for a while. I was uh, pretty badly beat up, so I was, you know, splashing water in my face, all that. 
uh, drove me around for a while, took my money out of my wallet, showed me how rich they were with all their Iraqi dinar, and finally took me to a, a command bunker that was there. I mean, they were pretty well dug in. I was surprised at how well they were dug in. I mean, concrete, two, three-story underground complexes. You know, not not some World War Two, you know, World War One trench. I mean, they were well dug in. And we went down a couple of store uh, stories of flights and or flights of stairs and uh, uh, so interrogated and all kinds of. What did I think? I thought I was going to get shot at any moment. You know, it took me about three days to figure out. Hey, they weren't going to just arbitrarily execute me. It was worth something to them, propaganda or intelligence or something. Uh, but most times you're walking around going, "Hey, I'm a." Okay, this is it. They're walking me out to shoot me, and that kind of grinds on you after a while emotionally because you get, you know, I'm gonna get shot. You know, you can only kiss your butt goodbye so many times before it starts to wear on you. <laughs> no, not a while, not for a while. Like I said, for about three days, and then I realized uh, I had uh, convinced myself I could make it to my birthday, which was July. You know, I got shot down in February. I can handle it to my six months, but I was there. The Vietnam guys were there six, seven years. Uh, those guys are my heroes. I don't know how they, how you could do that. I, I was there 19 days. That was long enough for me. The A-10 school we have here is the only active duty training unit of its kind in the Air Force. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Welcome to davis Monson Air Force Base. I'm Captain John Boyd, and I'll be one of your instructors. Over the next four months while you're here, we'll teach you how to fly and fight in the A-10, which is the first aircraft specifically designed for close air support of Army operations. We'll cover such subjects as aircraft systems, weapons effectiveness, and tactics we can employ in the A-10. Okay, Brian, let's set up for the target run. Gas is 8 over 12, and it look good. Unlike an RTU or a training unit for any of the other fighter aircraft, the A-10 community is a little different. The A-10 does not have a two-seat capability. He'll have about six to eight hours of simulator time. Therefore, when a student flies the A-10, the first time he takes it up, he's solo. So our role as an instructor becomes a little bit more complex sometimes because we're placed in the position of trying to evaluate his performance while flying a totally separate aircraft. Well, aside from flying, I consider the instructors the best part of this program because they, uh, they're really motivated to teach us how to fly. The instructor that you fly with is flying off of you on your wing, or you're flying on his wing. Therefore, we are totally in control of our aircraft and what happens. So if something does go wrong, then it is up to us to get back on the ground. The biggest advantage of being an instructor pilot in the A-10, as I see it, is that when we instruct a student on how to fly the A-10, we also get to fly. So let's say, for example, on a surface attack ride, the student's going to go out, drop some bombs, and shoot the gun, of course. We're going to be instructing him on how to do it and how to improve his scores. But in addition to that, while we're instructing, we also get to drop and to shoot. So our continuity and our training continues, even though we're serving primarily as an instructor pilot for most of the flights at davis Monton. Lieutenant Gingras, today's mission will be SAT-7 out of a series of 10 surface attack tactical rides. In keeping with the syllabus, this will be a high threat sortie. We'll be working on the East TAC range with two IPs, Alpha and Bravo, running in from Alpha first. Remember, it's critical that you depart right over the IP itself, be at altitude and on speed. Fence check complete, ready for chaff and flare. You're actually going to be leading the departure from the IP today while I'll be in chase. fun aircraft to fly. It's a great mission. You get to drop bombs and actually put ordnance on the target every day that we fly. Yeah. 